<laughs> All right, um, it's pretty much 10, so we'll start. Uh, hi, my name is Temperance. I'm uh, doing the first head construction panel. Um, we would go on through the basics of how to make various types of heads, tuning realistic, and that sort of thing. Uh, once I run through all this basic stuff, if you have any questions, feel free to put it away. Um, I've also got a few examples after the panel. If you want to come up and give them a touch, you're more than welcome to. I don't care. I promise. I, I know when you have a suit, it's like, it's, it's solid. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> God. Me, I'm like unpacking to this cod. I was like shoved my heads in the bag and I'm sitting on my suitcase to get clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they pull them out of the bag and it's just like, yeah, I can fix that. Just give the ear a squeeze and it totally goes back to shape. Um, okay. Uh, so let's start out with types of uh, fursuit heads. Um, soft and hard are basically the most uh, Generic forms of head. It's either a hard plastic like resin or vacuum form ABS plastic, or it's a soft foam, either a carved foam where you just buy a big block of upholstery foam and carve your head out, or a soft urethane like um, uh, soft expanding foam. So it's a chemical you mix and pour into a mold and it expands into your mold and then you basically pop out a soft squishy foam head. Uh, for the most part, although it's not necessarily a rule, uh, realistic heads tend to be resin-based, and tuny heads tend to be foam-based. There's various reasons for this. I personally make my tuny heads foam-based because realistic resin heads are quite small, and with tuny heads, you sort of want that exaggerated everything, and once you put on a big fluffy fursuit, having an itty bitty little teeny tiny head looks kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, and same vice versa with realistic heads, you tend to want to go with the resin because they'd be a little smaller. Uh, hard plastic heads have functionality for moving jaws that foam heads just don't quite work as well, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, for foam heads, uh, I'll start with that. Um, there's two basic ways to make a foam head. Um, there's the balaclava, which most people are familiar with, where you get the balaclava ninja hood, and they just glue foam to it until it's uh, the head shape you want. Or what I refer to as the head toaster. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is sort of what Matrices does, where she makes this giant foam helmet sort of thing. And then once that's fit on your head, then you just start gluing things to the giant foam helmet. Um, even after, well, Matrices, basically, even after she makes the head toaster and glues all the foam to it, she still glues a lining inside, which I highly recommend. Raw foam against your skin is really painful <laughs> after a while. Um, but head toasters are a little easier to make because uh, you're not like just trying to glue to a generic head armature shape. Uh, as for balaclavas, a lot of people like to buy balaclavas from sports stores. Really, really don't have to. Um, I will show you. I make my own balaclavas, and when I say make my own balaclavas, it is the stupidest, easiest design ever. I get spandex, I make a U, put two of them together, sew them together along this line, and then I cut out a bunch of the eyes. I swear that's all I do. You don't have to spend $30 on a custom-made balaclava. Make sure this is a bank. It's, it basically, it's just a U lining for the inside of your head. As long as it fits over your head, that's all you really need. It doesn't have to be fancy with like a, you know, a nose cone shape with a tighter neck. And you can pay through the nose like $30 to $50 for a balaclava off the internet but it's significantly cheaper to buy $8 worth of spandex and just make your own. The only thing to note if you're gonna be making your own balaclavas in that sort of style that I do, um, you have to have a sewing machine with a zigzag stitch. That's what? <laughs> you have to have a sewing machine with a zigzag stitch. When you're sewing spandex, if you sew just a straight line and get the spandex up, you'll just break all the threads because straight line threads are not meant for stretching. Um, zigzag stitch, look like that in your sewing machine. So when you give them a pull, they stretch out like a spring. Oh. So if you're sewing with any stretchy material, like for spandex or balaclavas, you have to have a zigzag stitch in your sewing machine. Most uh, hobby style sewing machines will have a stretch fabric a zigzag stitch. The only ones that won't are um, industrial machines which most of you probably won't have because they're thousands of dollars and <laughs> you don't need that for a hobby maker. 
Um, you can put balaclavas into resin heads too, but I usually don't bother because they're a little harder to work with. It's kind of easier just to have a balaclava you could put on and then put on your resin head versus one that's permanently lined in there. The reason they put balaclavas in foam heads is because, like I said, raw foam against your face is really uncomfortable. Um, for foam, uh, there's various types of foams you can use. Uh, as I mentioned before, I can use upholstery foam. I literally go to Walmart and buy the big rolls of foam. They're like four by eight, and then they're four inches thick. They come in a big roll. You cut open the bag and leave it on your floor, and they expand in 24 hours to a flat roll of foam, and then you can just cut them in pieces as you need. You don't have to go out and buy the fancy schmancy Bob's Foam Company, or whatever that company is that sells the big foam. You have to buy a block and carve it, though some people like to do that. I literally use the cheapest foam I could buy from Walmart. <laughs> Um, there's different types of foam, but you really don't have to get very fancy. Um, there's a type of foam called reticulated foam. It's, it's foam, but um, unlike basic regular upholstery foam, the, uh, the air pockets between the foam are not solidly connected, so you get more airflow through them. They're a nice idea in theory, because you should get more airflow so you can be more comfortable. However, it also, because of the structure, they're very, it's a very weak foam, so it'll tear very easily. So I really don't recommend it unless you like absolutely insist you would have to give it a try and see for yourself that it's totally not worth it. <laughs> um, the other type of foam, as I mentioned before, is the expanding foam. I use this with my heads. Both of these heads were made with an expanding foam and upholstery foam mix. So what I have is I have an assortment of sculpts I've made out of clay. Once you have the close clay sculpt of what you want your head to look like, you make a silicone cast of it and a plaster jacket, and then you just pour the, you buy a chemical foam. I use um, Smooth On Flex Foam at three. It expands 15 to 18 times the size. So if you mix one ounce of material, you'll get 15 ounces once it, once it expands. So you, you can be very frugal with the amount you use. Um, for those expanding foams, there's various thicknesses and densities. When you buy the foam, they'll have like a chart and it'll tell you how much it expands and how rigid it is. Um, the less it expands, the more rigid it is. So um, Flex Foam at 25 only expands two times. So if you mix one ounce, you get two ounces. But it's a really, really hard, dense foam. I only use that for like foos and stuff because you still need a little squishy, but you mostly want it to be rigid whereas I use the least dense and the most squishy for faces because I'll probably be carving them anyways and you don't want them super hard against your face. And again, because I'm cheap, <laughs> I want to get the most out of the least amount of <coughs> chemical I use. When you do that, do you have a negative um, like blank so you're pouring it in? Yes, yes. So it's filling from the outside in? Yeah, so like I said, I basically I'll sculpt, a, sculpt something out of clay, the shape of the head I want. I'll make a silicone mold of that and then I'll mix up the chemical, pour it into the silicone mold, and you roll it around so that all the sides are, are coated, and then you just leave it for 30 minutes, and the foam will just expand into the mold. So that requires a bit more work, because you're talking about chemicals and silicone, and... <laughs> See, I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> Good job, man. <laughs> um, I do believe uh, Razzy will be discussing how to do silicone and chemical mixing. Which does the advanced fursuit construction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about right now on it, but if you want more information after the after I've done the panel, I'm totally happy to explain it in more detail. Um, resin is very similar with the filling the mold, um, except instead of a soft, squishy surface, you're getting a hard surface. So again, you'd need to sculpt a base, make a silicone jacket, a plaster jacket, fill it with resin, and slush it around. And, you have to do several layers of this because you can't just dump a ton of resin in and roll it around because you'll end up with big, heavy globs of resin. So you have to do it in small amounts and it takes a long time. However, you can get a nice, thin, lightweight base out of it. Um, I prefer, personally, vacuum forming. However, it's a big investment. Um, if you're going to do a hard, or hard head, uh, there's two basic classes you can use, which is resin, which is the chemical where you pour it into a mold and so roll around is called a slush cast. And the other option is vacuum forming. Vacuum forming is where you get sheets of plastic, ABS or styrene in various thicknesses. You heat it up in an oven or a heat table. 
you transfer it to a vacuum form table, which is a table with a vacuum attachment where you actually stick like a power vacuum into it, and there's a bunch of holes in the table. So you'll put a hard mold on top of this table with all the holes in and turn on the vacuum, and when you put your heat melted plastic on it, the plastic will suck down into the mold you've made. The problem with the vacuum forming is it's, it's very cheap to make lots of molds, but the setup is very expensive. So for resin, you'd be looking at thirty to forty dollars to make a to make a single head, and for vacuum for, uh, for vacuum forming, you have a five hundred dollar investment before you can even start making heads. But instead of making thirty dollars per head, you can make a head for about five bucks each once you have the vacuum form set up. So most people who do vacuum forming are already pros because they have the vacuum form set up, or they're already costume makers. The, the investment for the setup, if you're not going to use it, is it worth it? Um, you can try, I know there's, depends where you live, but uh, I know in the US you guys have like tech shops where they have vacuum form tables and you basically just sign up, it's, it's like a club membership and you can use any of, the, any of the various power tools and crafting tools they have and I know they all have 3D printers and vacuum form machines. So you pay this, this monthly membership fee and you can use any of the resources they have in the thing as long as you take the course on it. So a cheap option for I want to try a vacuum forming without buying a $500 or making a $500 vacuum form machine is to try one of these tech shops. I don't know if Seattle has one, doesn't even know. <laughs> Do they? Yeah, we've got uh, at least two. Oh good. I know, I know San Jose has a couple and every time I see them I'm like, why don't you have these in Canada? I hate you. <laughs> um, if you want to use vacuum form versus resin, the other major trouble with vacuum forming is you can't have undercuts. So if you want various detail um, <coughs> with like pronounced cheeks and things, um, you can get away with it with resin because the cast you're going to use is going to be a soft plastic, so you can stretch it around the resin once it's in the thing. However, with vacuum forming, you're literally sucking plastic down onto a mold, and then when you lift the plastic off, the mold's supposed to plop at the bottom. So, if... <coughs> so, if you had a mold like this, this plastic would suck down on it and then the mold would just plop out once you're done. If you had a cast like this and the plastic sucked in, you'd have to destroy your mother mold to get it out so you'd only get one use out of it. So it's not worth it. However, if you're doing resin, you may have really pronounced cheeks that will tuck in and if you have that, you can't use uh, the vacuum form. So it's entirely a cost thing and a preference thing depending on what your end sculpt looks like. So once you have your base, foam, resin, vacuum form, regardless, um, cardboard, <laughs> whatever you choose to use, however you, you want something that they can absorb sweat and sort of things. Um, when I started I tried making a few paper mache heads. It can work, <laughs> but they don't last very long. Um, I've used all of plaster as well. Again, same thing. It's the, I'm trying to make a suit for the first time. And then <coughs> sweat soaks in, and they'll disintegrate after like five or six wears. It's, it's the cheap option everyone tries when they first start suit making. But for a long lasting head, you really, you really have to use something to absorb sweat and not disintegrate with the moisture. So foam, resin, ABS plastic vacuum forming are probably your best options. Um, as for jaws, moving jaws, you really can't get a very good moving jaw out of a foam head. The problem is foam flexes. Like, just looking at any, any piece of foam, you can see they're squishy, they'll squish with even the slightest manipulation. So if you try to make a moving jaw out of a foam head, you can, it'll move, like if it sits on your jaw right, but you have to really exaggerate. So when you're talking like this, the jaw won't move or it'll move very slightly, and if you want to make the mouth move, you have to, nah, nah, and you look retarded and feel retarded. <laughs> um, so when you're making moving jaws, the best option is a resin or a vacuum form or a hard plastic something. Um, 
There's two ways to make a moving jaw. Um, it's entirely preferable. Some makers use one, some use others. I've tried them both and found which one worked best for me, and that's the one I use. Uh, however, you may go, how the hell did you make that work? It doesn't work for me. And then someone else, oh, this method totally works. I don't know why, it's just the nuance of however you built it. One works better than the other. Uh, the, the two basic versions are hinges, elastics, um, yeah, basically, Hin hinges and elastics. So a hinge is, you'll have two pieces of plastic with a uh, screw joint in them. And so you'll, the jaw will be separate and only attached by two screw joint points. And then as you speak, the, the jaw will flop up and down. The other option is elastic, where instead of having an actual physical hinge, you'll just put a piece of elastic on either side of the face, and that just gives enough stretch for the mouth to move. Every time I put elastic in, the mouths don't work anymore. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but a ton of maker uses elastic, and it works great for them, but for me, it's never worked, and it drives me crazy. But you may work with hinges and go, how the hell did you make this work? I can only work with elastic. So it's entirely preferable which one works best for you. I wish I had a stand instead of a chair. <laughs> so I'll start by explaining the hinge because it's easier. This is the thing that works for me. So your basic hinge, this is literally what they look like. This is what my top hinge looks like, and this is what my bottom hinge looks like. Uh, some people like to sculpt these and cast them out of resin. I literally cut up garbage cans, I swear. I, I go to the dollar store and I buy those cheap Sterilite garbage cans. I also use some fries. <laughs> and yeah, you just cut like a, sort of a rectangle piece, and I like to curl the edges because it's a little more comfortable. And then the bottom one needs to be more of a jaw shape. You can see just a own <coughs> jaw. Uh, your jaw hinge mechanism when you're speaking is actually back here. So you sort of follow the line of the jaw so you'll have a slight angle to it. So these two pieces would go together. Like so, and then you put a screw there. I use what are called Chicago screws. It is basically a screw post with um, a screw hole. You How can I say this is sound dirty? <laughs> it's um, this is what Chicago screws look like. So you'll have a, a screw base and then a, a male screw that screws into it. Um, so it gives you a quarter of an inch, half an inch, whatever size Chicago screw you buy worth of wiggle room. So these aren't, uh, you don't hinge them super tight. You want the jaw to float a little on the screws. So I use a quarter of an inch Chicago screw size. So this is a quarter of an inch here. And I use a, just a dab of uh, super glue so to keep the screws shut. Sometimes if you don't, just the movement of opening your mouth and closing it will loosen the screws and they'll fall out. So just a dab of super glue seems to hold them in place really good. So this would be the top part of my mask here. This would be the jaw part. Um, and just that, uh, just that small little mechanism there will allow the jaw to move. Some people like to um, add an elastic here or a screw here. And what it does is it'll snap the jaw closed after you've opened your mouth. <coughs> Every time I use an elastic, they stop working. <laughs> I don't know why, it drives me nuts. Um, what I do instead is I have what I call a jaw cup. It is a piece of flexible wire sheeting that I cover in uh, uh, fleece. And it just sits on your jaw, kind of like a football helmet, like a jaw cup. And the way the jaw cup sits on your chin is just enough to cup the chin in place so you don't need that screw or that elastic. And as you speak, the, the jaw cup will just sit nicely on your chin and open and close with your mouth. So you don't, when you're making your, your uh, your moving jaws. The moving jaw doesn't have to come right up to here. It just needs to be on the the part of your jaw that moves the most, which is just at the very tip of your jaw. Um, I've heard some people actually go out and buy like replacement jaw cups from football helmets, and I suppose that's an option. I've never done it because I'm cheap. <laughs> 
Um, also, different people have different shapes and sizes of jaws. So having a flexible wire sheeting at least gives them a chance <coughs> to pinch it until it fits comfortably on their jaw. And yes, you had a question? Uh, does it depend on how heavy the bottom jaw is? Yes, the heavier the bottom jaw, the more likely you might need an elastic or a spring to have it snap back up. And about how heavy would that be in ounces? Oh, in half. <laughs> I have no idea, really. I, I never whip out a scale, so it's not like I have any idea how much stuff weighs, but um, the more stuff you put in your jaw, the heavier it's going to be. So if you have a solid, if you've got a resin jaw and then a solid jaw set, like one of those plastic teeth things, and then a silicone tongue, the more stuff you're putting in there, the heavier and heavier it gets. This could probably be why DBC, uh, Dream Vision Creations, they use springs, so their jaws are spring-loaded. It's probably because you can't just use a subtle jaw cup because you, you, the jaw would, the, yeah, the jaw's so heavy it would fall right off your jaw, so they need something to snap it back up. Uh, for the most part, when I do mouths, I know these are all 2 so I didn't bring it realistic. Um, it's just the teeth that are resin, the tongues are fleece, the jaw is resin, but it's just light because it's just a little piece like that big. So my jaws aren't very heavy to begin with, which could explain why the elastic doesn't work for me. Um, the one thing you need to know about placing jaws, a lot of people when they start attempting a moving jaw, they'll try to put the elastic here. The problem is, if you've ever seen what your skull looks like, like I mentioned before, your jaw hinge is actually back here by your ear. So if you put the elastic here, the jaw won't move at all, no matter how your jaw cup is placed, because um, your, your mouth is trying to open here, but it needs to open back here. So you have to put the hinges really far back on the head in order to get any movement at all. Otherwise, if the elastic was here, your jaw would actually do the opposite thing. It would start flipping up into the upper palate of the mouth because too much weight is hitting the wrong point. Is that, does that make sense everybody? <laughs> I know, I'm like, I'm like, this is like verbal diarrhea, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so let's say this guy had a moving jaw. The moving jaw mechanism, the hinges, would come back here. This would be where the Chicago screw would be. Because as I move, <coughs> my jaw would be sitting here, manipulating it. Um, however, if you try to put the elastic here, I'd keep pushing down, and I'd be fighting the elastic, and the jaw would start going up. <coughs> because the hinge is in the wrong spot. That makes more sense. OK, good. <laughs> This is the trouble. Suit makers are very good at going, well, I just did the thing with the, let me show you. And, and we don't realize that not everyone like, understands suit maker speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sing the song of my people. <laughs> um, eyeballs. OK, um, again, it depends, realistic or tuning. Yes? I've seen one other draw that I thought it was so simple, and it worked so well, I was like, Wow. Oh, and the that's cup um, the one beast cup. Yes. Uses. Oh, you know, I totally forgot. And yes. My friend spot because he has a suit that looks just like her. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. And I was just like, Yes. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Actually, Beast Cup has these really crazy jaws, and they're totally awesome. I don't know how the hell she does them. I've, I've seen her suits up close. I've held them. And for some reason, I can't quite figure out how she does these jaws. But yes, Beast Cup makes jaws completely different from any other maker. Instead of having hinges or elastics or screws or whatever, what she does is, if she can only do this on certain heads because it has to have enough fluffy, fluffy fur to hide it, but the jaw is actually separate from the head entirely. You get a really, really sensitive jaw out of it because literally there is no hinges, no elastics, no anything in the way. You're just moving your mouth as you normally would. So it's like a, it's like a jaw piece, and she uses the fur at the cheek parts to cover up the fact that there's a, a distinct line where the, they're separate. So the jaw piece sits here on your jaw, and it has an elastic that goes around the back of your head. And then you put on the top of the head like a helmet, and you get these super, super sensitive jaws out of it, and you can do any adjusting you need to make it look perfect. The trouble with moving jaws, sometimes you can, they start to get crooked, depending on how well you line them up. And Hers. You can that um, mesh and fleece <coughs> just like, from here to here is it actually working? Um, it could. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of 
you'll, you'll have a perfect moving jaw and then you'll fur the head and something went wrong and suddenly it's not perfectly lined up anymore. Makers hate making moving, moving jaws. But everybody wants moving jaws, so we have to make moving jaws. But yeah, sometimes you'll have a perfect moving jaw and then you'll put all the fur on it and suddenly the jaw's like and you don't know why and you do a ton of things to try and fix it and yeah, it drives us crazy. And then you have to tear off the fur and start over again. But yes, these cuff jaws are really crazy that way because yes, they're completely se a separate piece. And then you put on the head like a helmet, and once you fluff down the, the fur on either side, you do not tell that it's not a single piece. And you get gloriously sensitive jaws out of it. I've been trying to figure out how to do that, like search you online, but there's no way I can search. It's trade secrets. This is, this is, I was like, I, I, I'm rooming with some friends who are writers, and, and there's so many people on their panels. And I'm like, why is no one teaching any of the first year making panels? It's because no one wants to tell people how they do shit, because then, <laughs> then they'll know, and then it's competition. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to look at a beast cub head, She does have a video on YouTube that says jaw movement test examples, and she shows you the three different types of heads. One with a static jaw like this, one with a hinged jaw, and then one with the jaw you mentioned, which is a completely separate jaw. And you can, it's like night and day. You can see exactly how crazy the jaw movement you can get out of those is. Um, okay, uh, eyeballs. Uh, so you have eyeballs. It depends if you want to go toony or realistic, obviously. Uh, for toony, um, most people do the same basic idea. It's just plastic sheeting with uh, a mesh fabric of some type. Um, the plastic sheeting, as I mentioned, from the hinges, I, I, I literally go to dollar stores and buy garbage cans and just cut out eyeballs. And then you dremel in the center and use a knife to clean them up. And they look glorious. And it entirely depends what type of plastic you get. When you go to the dollar store with <coughs> plastic garbage cans, uh, give them a little bend. See, they have to have a little bit of flex. They can't be so solid you can't bend them at all because otherwise while you're cutting it, they'll snap. Because uh, a really hard, brittle plastic will just, it'll just snap every time you try and manipulate it at all. So most of these eyes, are they have a little bit of flexibility in them. So you can see I can give these a pinch. And then they'll, they'll flex a little bit under my fingers. Um, Sterilite, I think, is the brand I use. I try and buy the garbage cans that are slightly curved so you can get a slightly more curved eye. I've seen people use like bottles of bleach because you get a nice curve at the top of the bleach. However, it's a really, really thin plastic. These plastics are about a thick sixteenth of an inch. Those are like a 132, so they're like paper thin. So I don't recommend bleach bottles. You'd be better off with a garbage can, like I said, as long as it's a squishy plastic. Um, and then the mesh on the inside, uh, you may have heard the term buckram. Uh, it took me forever to figure out what the heck a buckram was. But you know what it is? If you go to the cross stitch, stitch section of your local craft store, it is that weaved material that cross stitchers use. So there's just slight little cracks of holes in it. You can paint them with fabric paint or uh, alcohol markers. Um, Various, they have to be a light liquid paint. If it's a really thick paint, it'll actually, the liquid will actually seep into the holes and then you can't see through it anymore. Uh, what I use is referred to, it's still a cross stitch fabric, but it's a very specific type of cross stitch fabric. It's called Irish linen. Uh, Irish linen, uh, unlike other cross stitch fabrics which have several layers of lines between the holes, uh, Bucker, uh, Irish linen is a single thread. So later on, you guys can come up and take a look, but you can see the mesh is very, very, very fine because it's just a single thread of cotton and really loosely woven. Um, I've heard of various other materials people use with varying success. I had a friend who used pantyhose, which worked quite well, but it had a weird look to it. Like he, he, instead of just doing the plastic, he had to basically make the entire eye out of white pantyhose and then just paint the bit in the, in the middle with the iris and the, and the pupil. So it has a different look to it, but you get a ton more vision because you get the entire eye of pantyhose versus just the iris and the pupil. Um, for realistic eyes, uh, what most people use are referred to as cabochons. A cabochon is basically a half circle. That's this is the official. This is your learning. Your 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 learning for today. A, a half circle or half sphere is called a cabochon. 
I, I asked, I asked the, on my plastic store, I sold cabochons, and he's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> like, it's a half sphere. He's like, you saved me so much time. People keep asking me if I can buy half spheres, and I kept looking up H. <laughs> I was supposed to look up C. <laughs> uh, I get mine from Tap Plastics. They're, it's literally just a sphere that's been cut in half. You can get them in various sizes. Most makers use uh, one and a half inch. Uh, the size for cabochons is the size of the circle itself. So this distance needs to be one and a half. <laughs> That's what they're referring to is this exact distance. So you may buy one inches thinking they're really huge and they're this big. They're itty bitty super tiny because it's not the dome part, it's this distance here that they're referring to the size. Most makers use one and a half. Um, if you want to go with a really, really realistic head, you can go down to a one inch, but you wouldn't want to go any smaller, otherwise they're like, little bitty dolls like <coughs> he has. And some people go larger, but remember they get very heavy, because this is a half sphere. If you went with a three inch, If you went with a three inch dome, this is how much plastic you're getting out of it. You're getting like one and, a, or one and a half inches of plastic in the dome part to get a full three inches. So they can get very heavy and very big. You don't realize how big they are until you have one. Um, the other option aside from acrylic cabochon, some people cast their own eyes. You have to use uh, fiberglass resin which unlike white resins, which most people use for smudge casting for head bases, uh, a, a fiberglass resin is a clear resin. You add one chemical, then you add what's called a catalyst. You add like two or three drops, it's a math thing, you know, one ounce, you add one drop. And it stinks to high heaven, it takes a week to cure. Half the time when I made eyes this way, I'd have to throw out like 80% of them because they'd get bubbles or warps or wrinkles and, Oh, never again. It's also really toxic. Um, uh, solid plastic resins, yes, they're bad for you, and yes, you have to wear a respirator, but the odor is very subtle. Uh, fiberglass resin sinks to high heaven, gives you headaches. If you don't use a respirator and use a ventilated area, you're basically killing yourself and anything near you. It is so toxic. So I don't even bother anymore. It's, it's cheaper and safer for me to go to tap plastics and buy cabochons than it is to make a ton throw out like 60% of them because they failed in some way and end up with a couple. So with eyes, if you're going to do the acrylic uh, version, uh, in order to get the, the follow me appearance, you can get away with them with cabochons because they're so deep. So you're, I'm not getting an official follow me. Uh, it, it's not really follow me, but because they're so deep, it gives the illusion of them following you. Um, and it's basically just because of the curvature of the dome. So you paint the flat side, and that's you have to start pupil first and then go outward, because everything you paint on first will show up the best, and then any layers you add on top will show up less because you're, you're basically painting backwards. You're not painting and then adding highlights on top. You paint the pupil and the highlights, and then you add the background colors. Um, if you want to put LEDs in them, it's actually very simple. Um, if you're casting them with resin, you put in the LED as the resin is curing. If you're doing cabochons, I literally just get a Dremel, drill a hole in the side, and stick the LED in. It sounds and they look horrible until you put eyelids on and then you totally can't tell that there's an LED in there. Uh, eye screens for... Um, Realistic eyes. Again, it's preference. Some people like to use the same buckram they use on toony eyes. I use this stuff. It's it's a thin, thin wire mesh. I, I literally go out and buy those splash screens for when you're frying bacon. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> this is like my garbage can circuit. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so it's a super, super fine mesh. Um, you can see through it really well. It takes uh, paint, airbrush paints, it takes markers really well. 
Um, the only problem with this is you can really only use this on realistic heads. Like I can't use it on a tuning head. You see gorgeously out of them. However, if you have a camera with flash and you catch it at just the right angle, you'll take a picture of the wearer inside. So I've got a few, a few photos of myself in various suits where my head was tilted just slightly towards the camera and the flash went off and the flash goes right through the mesh and you can see my eyeball like next to my eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an easy Photoshop fix, but it's really creepy. So you can really only do this on realistic heads because unlike toony heads where the eyes are directly in front of you, with realistic heads, they're kind of off to the side and slightly slanted because you're putting them where the tear ducts are, not directly where the eyes are. So looking at it straight on, you can see right through it, but looking at it slight to the side, I can still see still right through it, but a camera flash won't give me that creepy eyeball person inside the costume look. Um, I'll pass this around because it's kind of cool. And don't poke yourself on it, I know there's got sharp edges. That stuff is great at nighttime. Like if you're doing like dances and stuff and you, you have a suit you can do the realistic eyes with. It is glorious. You'll see a million times better than you will out of any mesh. <coughs> they have to prime it to get the paint to stick. No, actually, you know what I do is when I when I'm putting them on, I grab a sharpie and I just black them out. And then when I'm doing the airbrushing for finishing touches up, I'll just spray them with uh, with airbrush paint, and it sticks like a dream. Okay. The only thing you have to do is when you're done airbrushing, you have to go in with a Q-tip and just clean the little edges because sometimes the paint will spread or splash over. Um. Oh yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention, with Toonie Eyes, some people use screen doors. You know, the screen door mesh, and you just put a couple of them together, and I guess that works too. I've never tried it, but you get glorious vision out of it, apparently. Mm. <coughs> okay, teeth. Um, when you're starting out, you probably don't want to learn how to cast resin, it's a bit scary. A lot of people start with Sculpty. That's just, you know, the model clay you buy at the, back, or the craft store, like Fimo and you just sculpt your teeth and put them in the oven and you make a nice hard teeth. Um, the more teeth you start making, the easier it is to get resin. So you just sculpt clay, make a little silicone mold, and just pour teeth as you need. Uh, I, I knew a person who used to buy those uh, Halloween vampire teeth, you know, the one you put in your mouth. <laughs> and she just cut the ends off and stick those in the mouth. <laughs> they work surprisingly well. If I didn't know exactly what those were, I'd be like, damn, those are really well sculpted teeth. <laughs> They're cute for little itty bitty teeth. Um, uh, the trouble with Sculpty is, uh, versus re resin can be quite light. Sculpty can be a little heavier. So it, although it's the cheaper option, especially if you're just starting out, um, it's also very heavy. So you want to be very... Uh, frugal with the amount of sculpt you use, like don't use the whole block, just sculpt the little teeth either in a, in a set row like this, where it's, it's just a little U of teeth, or sculpt individual little nubs and glue them into the mouth. Don't, don't use the entire block, because sculpting gets very, very heavy very quickly. Mm. Occasionally, if you have a really, really tuny head, you can use fleece or vinyl for teeth. Uh, it's more commonly used to say you're making a warthog or a saber tooth or something. However, it also gets dirtier faster. Um, tongues. Uh, I use fleece for all my tongues. It's light and easy, and no one's really going to get a good look at your tongues because they're hidden in a mouth behind some teeth. So you can get away with just a little glimpse of fleece. And if you sew them correctly, you can get a nice little curl out of them, like a real tongue. Uh, I usually make these in bulk. I'll buy like a meter of fleece, and I'll sew a bunch of little U's, and then I run a, uh, a sewing line right down the middle, and that gives you like the middle muscle of the tongue. And when you give them a little, when you glue them in and then just sort of poke them, they all just sort of curl up like a nice looking tongue. Yeah. Hard to get them. So yeah, my tongues are the most basic of all tongues. Same as my balaclavas, I just sew a little U, and then I'll stitch up the middle to give that little muscle line in the middle of the tongue, and I just hot glue them in. Some people, if they want a really realistic suit, they'll use the silicone tongues. Silicone is nice, it does give a very realistic look, um, however, it's very heavy. Um, 
If anyone, you've, if you have any friends who have silicone uh, paw pads, you can tell just how heavy their paws are compared to, say, fleece paw pads. Uh, silicone is very dense. It's nice and squishy and gives a nice texture, but there's that weight, like you mentioned, with your jaws. The more weight you add in the jaw, the heavier it's going to be, and the more it might sag. And a lot of people, they just don't like that extra weight in the face, because if they've got a silicone nose and a silicone tongue and huge chunky resin ears and then a full resin head, and say they've got horns or something, next thing you know, you've got a five pound head and it gets really heavy. So you have to be sparingly what you want. Um, what, what's worth the weight and what isn't worth the weight? And it's never been, for me, I've never ever used silicone because it's just too much weight in the mouth for me, personally. Uh, noses, same problem. Um, some people like to use the silicone noses because you get a nice realistic squishy nose out of them, but it adds a ton of weight because you're basically, your average nose is about this big. So there's a, at least an ounce of silicone in there and that's very heavy. So it'll draw the weight of the nose down quite a lot. However, it does give a really nice realistic squishy feel to it, which a lot of people like if you want to go really realistic. I've seen people use leather. Yes, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going through all the list. So there's silicone, uh, fleece, leather, vinyl. Those are very popular if you want to go for more toony. You just sew a basic nose shape or you sculpt a drop of foam and then stretch vinyl, fleece, or leather around the shape. And it gives you a nice nose, but it's only good for toony noses like these because um, they're not... Uh, you can get away with uh, with with less realism than two D. If you put if you made a fleece nose for a, uh, a realistic head, it would be blatantly obvious. That it doesn't look that real, and it's kind of weird looking. No matter no amount of painting will solve that. Uh, one option, if you still want that realistic nose but don't want the weight of it, you can make a resin nose. It's basically the same thing. You can use the same molds, except you can resin is lighter than silicone. And the nice thing about resin is you can slush cast it like you do with the head. So you'd roll the resin around and you end up with just a thin layer of resin. And then you fill it in with an expanding foam. And that makes a super light, hard, realistic looking nose without the weight of a silicone nose. However, they can get scratched and they can crack more easily because silicone is squishy, resin is not. Uh, this guy here has a resin nose. So it gives a nice look. You can get a nice texture on it. It's significantly lighter than silicone, um, but it's entirely preference what you choose. If you want, it's best to make the, sil or make the resin nose out of whatever color you want it to be. Painting it afterwards can lead to uh, scraping and chipping. Uh, silicone, you cannot paint silicone. So whatever color you cast it in is the color it's going to be forever. Nothing sticks to silicone. Not even silicone sticks to silicone. So when you cast a silicone nose or if you purchase a silicone nose, it is whatever color you bought it as and that's the color it will be forever. However, with resin, yes, you can paint it, but you have to seal it with something. However, there is a risk of chipping. Um, some people do uh, foam urethane noses. So like I mentioned, these heads are made out of uh, expanding foam urethane. You could also use those for noses as well. A lot of people like using foam urethane noses if they want squeaker noses, you know where you poke them and they squeak, because it's a squishy foam. Um, and just make sure when you buy your urethane, you have to buy um, self-skinning urethane. So when you, uh, when you cast it, it's, it will expand into this mold and when you pop it out, it'll actually have a skin on it, kind of like a Nerf gun. You know, like, if you've ever seen those Nerf footballs, they sort of have that skin. They're made out of expanding urethane. So you'll basically get a nice skin like that, so it'll sort of be soft and a little squishy and yielding. So if you want to make a squeaker nose like that, you have to put the squeaker in, pour in the foam, and let the foam expand around the squeaker. Uh, urethane, however, can has a higher chance of uh, cracking or cut, getting cut or damaged because it's just a soft foam. Never ever go near someone with scissors or sharp nails or something because they'll just rip the foam apart and you'll ruin your nose entirely. Then pretty much the only repair would be to like cover it with a fabric to hide the damage. Um, other than noses, um, oh ears. Okay, 
Um, for ears, I, I again, it's, this is the cheap thing. I buy those. I buy those foam sheets, you know, the, the stuff that kids make for crafts, sheet foam. Um, you can buy the, you, most commercial ones are the uh, <coughs> 1 16th inch, however you can also buy uh, 1 8th inch, they're a little thicker. And I use that for ears as a base, and then I just cover them with fleece and fur. Depending on what style of head I'm making, I'll either put on the ears first or the ears last. When I make realistic heads, I make the entire head, then I make the ears separately and sew them in once the entire head is done. With toonie heads, once I make the full foam head, I put the foam ears on and then I fur it. You can do whichever way is more comfortable for you. However, I seem to find every time I do realistic heads and I put the ears on first, they always end up lopsided or weird. So it's just one of those preference things you, you only learn by doing. You may find that, I gotta put the ears on at the very, very last and it works great or vice versa, I gotta put the ears on first. Um, some people, aside from using the sheet foam, like a lot of people use the sheet foam because it's, it's nice and rigid, it holds its shape well, and once you cover with fur, you don't have to worry about it getting damaged or anything like that. Uh, some people use yoga mats. It's the same material that sheet foam is made out of, but it's a little thicker, so you can get a more thicker, dense ear, and it's less likely to get bent or ruined when you're packing or shipping to a con. Um, some people use entirely foam, like they'll just buy foam and just keep adding stuff until it's an ear. And some people actually use resin. Uh, resin's again one of those things where you have to sculpt the entire ear, cast it in silicone, cast it in resin. However, you'll get a very nice realistic uh, identical ear every time you do it. You don't have to cut it out and then try and figure out how you did it last time to get the shape right. Uh, but they're more brittle and they're more likely to crack, especially if you store it or if you're um, if you're traveling and TSA decides to be a little rough with your suit, <laughs> ears can crack and break in the, if they're made out of resin or a, or a breakable plastic like that. Um, everyone has their different style for what they do with their ears. I uh, usually, I'll, the interiors of my ears are fleece, felt, I've used leather sometimes, sometimes I use a short pile fur depending on what appearance I want it to have. Uh, the backs will be fur. I'll often shave them down a little because, especially with really long fur, like you don't need really long shaggy shaggy fur or your wolf might turn into a bear very quickly. So you can just do a little bit of shaving to style it down. And you'll, if you ever look at photos of real animals, they sort of have hair, like guard hairs in the interiors of their ears. So a lot of people like to glue in, just on the inside, uh, little little triangles of, of a longer fur to get that sort of guard hair look. It makes a very nice shape if you get it right. <laughs> it was me! <laughs> Excuse yourself! <laughs> was that the reindeer maybe? <laughs> I saw it just ate. Maybe, or murdering a violin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot where I was. Ears. Uh, ear hair. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to say about ears. They're. Yeah. They're. Look, look at them. Look at them. <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought. Damn that door. <laughs> um, oh, oh, yes, furry. Okay, so now that you've got your foam head and you've got your eyeballs and you got your teeth and you've got your jaw all set up and you've got your nose and your ears, Yay. now you got to put the whole thing together. So what I use is I use duct tape. It's a <laughs> glorious pattern maker. It blow, every time I post a video of me doing this, I'm like, what are you doing with the duct tape? Um, duct tape is the, um, the handyman's version of drafting a drape pattern. So seamstresses and people who make costumes and make clothing, most of the time if they need to make a pattern, what they do is what's called drape. So they'll drape the fabric over a model or over a, a mannequin and make pins where they want the bends and folds and darts to be. And then they'll take that fabric, make a mock-up out of buckram, and then, um, or not buckram, sorry, uh, broadcloth, and then they'll make a final pattern once they know what everything is. Um, however, you can do something significantly faster and, well, I can say cheaper, but <laughs> um, significantly faster and easier with duct tape. Okay. 
So you basically tape your entire foam work or resin work with duct tape, draw lines as to where you want colors to change, then you peel that duct tape off. I like to put it on carpet or something just so it's not as sticky. Peel it off the carpet and then you can cut out the pieces, stick them on your fur, cut out the fur pieces and sew them together and stick them on your head. So it's, it's, a, it's a simple process that gets easier the more and more you do it. Um, I've gotten to the point where I know my heads are symmetrical enough, I don't need to tape the whole head, so I only tape half the head. And then I just flip it over and double the pattern on the other side. However, when you're just starting out, I'd recommend taping the entire head first. It's just a little easier, and it's all, I, okay, that's fine. I will tape the whole head sometimes if I have something asymmetrical. So like this guy, for example, I've only got the scars on one side of the head. So I probably tape the entire head to make sure that I get the scars in the right spot on the right side and I won't affect the other side of the head, which doesn't have that feature. Um, once you have your tape pattern out, um, again, the more you do it, the easier it gets. So when you start doing your duct tape patterns, write all over them. You want to write down what color goes where, what part it is. Left you want, and right. Yep, yeah, left and right. You want to put little guidelines so you know how to line up the lines properly because once it's a, a, just a hunk of fabric, where the hell was the nose part? What, how did these pieces line up again? I've totally forgotten. So mark them, write down the color, and write down the fur direction. When you look at um, animals in real life, when you look at uh, fursuit heads, Direction of fur goes from nose to toes. So it goes away from the nose and down the back of the head. It goes away from the nose and down the back, or down the side of the neck. It goes away from the nose and jaw, down the front of the neck. So never have the fur going this direction, except for accents like hair. It should always go away from the nose. So what I do is I draw a little arrow to remind myself which way I want the fur direction to go. The only fur direction that's going to go the opposite way are the ears. For ears, it goes from the base of the ear to the tip. So for that, the direction would be up to the tip, up to the tip. But otherwise, back, nose to toes, that's how you remember. So once you have all your directions on, you put down, you cut all your pieces out, you sew them together. Um, there's various ways to glue fur and various ways to put it on. When you're starting out, most people tend to just put the block of fabric they have, glue it down. Take the next block of fabric they have, glue it down. It works, and I did it for years. Um, however, it can leave little, like you'll, you'll can feel on the seams, it'll feel bumpy or hard. That's because some of the glue seeped through and it may have you know, gotten into the fur and left little clumps. So if you're just making suits for yourself and it works great for you, go ahead. Once you start making suits for a while and you want to up your game or if you start making suits for other people, you really have to start sewing them. So it depends on the quality of your machine. Uh, my sewing, I, for the most part, I, I machine sew almost everything except little accents, which I have to hand sew. A lot of people, though, they either don't have a machine to begin with or their machine's kind of crappy. Then you have to hand sew all the pieces together. Uh, whenever I hand sew fur, I do what's called a blanket stitch. When you machine sew, so do you sew them with a flat stitch so they're just butted up again? So do you put them up into a seam? And yeah. When I'm machine sewing, I do just a basic straight stitch. So I put the two pieces of fur together and I just run a straight stitch down with the machine. However, when you're hand sewing, the best stitch to do for fur is called a blanket stitch. So you put your two pieces of fur together, fur facing each other, so um, good, good, good sides in, the outsides out. And a blanket stitch, when it's done right, will look like this. So it'll sort of look like a ladder. So you'll have a stitch going in and then a stitch running along the top. And how to make a blanket stitch. Basically, as you're running your stitch through, <coughs> instead of just, um, running to the next bit like so. You tie your head. I'm like, can people see this? People in the back? Okay, I'm like, I'm like I'll just draw it bigger. <laughs> yeah, turn off the resolution. 
<laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Draw bigger. <laughs> so instead of just sewing to the next stitch like so, what you do is once the stitch goes through, you run it. Instead of running the next stitch like so, first thing because we're very good at showing and not drawing. <laughs> you run it back through the loop and then pull it tight. I see. And then run it back through the loop and pull it tight. This is a really bad drawing. I'm sorry. I highly recommend you look up Blanket Stitch on YouTube. <laughs> 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 if I had more than a whiteboard and my shoe drawing skills, we could totally do that. <laughs> yes, um, look up blanket stitch on the internet. You can just use a straight stitch if you're more comfortable with it. However, blanket stitch gives you a really nice tight edge. Yes? Yeah. Uh, would you suggest um, using upholstery thread yes. over regular thread? Yes. Um, I use upholstery thread um, or jean thread or <clears throat> what's referred to as coats thread. And by coats, they mean like jackets, like parkas and stuff. It's a thicker thread, usually polyester. Um, it's highly recommended if you're sewing a fur to use a higher density uh, thread like that. You can use uh, a regular thread, but I suggest you double up if you're going to sew that way. And for the love of God and all that is holy, never ever use cotton thread. Cotton thread breaks just by looking at it. Uh, the, only people, <laughs> the only people who use cotton thread are quilters. <clears throat> And it's because their stitches are so fine they can get away with it. But cotton thread is the worst thread in the entire world, and I hate it like the devil. <laughs> yes, make sure you buy your thread, get the extra strong, get jeans thread, get coats thread, or get upholstery thread. All of those are extra thick and extra strong. Um, if you're going to buy regular thread, double it up, but you get the 100% polyester, never the 100% cotton. Um, okay, so once you've got your hand all sewn, you need to glue it in place. I just use uh, hot glue at key points. So I sew up the entire head, squish the head, and shove it into my like fully sewn head piece. And then I lift up pieces and put glue in key points and then flatten it back down. Some people prefer to do it in chunks, so they won't sew up the entire head, they may sew up the entire front and then leave the sides open so they can access it, or they'll leave like the jaw edge open so they can access it as needed. Uh, you'll find out what works best for you. I personally, I just don't like hand sewing, so the least I can do, the better. So I'll lift up certain sections. I'll glue where there's um, anywhere there's uh, divots that go in because you need the glue to hold it into those. So you'll glue around the eyes, edges of the nose, edges of the mouth. Anywhere where it dips in, anywhere above the eyebrows where it dips in, glue along the inside of the ears, that sort of thing. So a lot, like if you, if we got, when we're done, if you want to come up and take a look, you can see this isn't glued down to the foam, but because it's stretched over and it's nice and tight, it doesn't have to be. Um, realistic heads, same basic premise as for the uh, toonie head with made of foam. The only difference is when I'm making realistic heads, I sew up the entire face glue it down to the hard base, and then I make the back of the head and hand sew the back of the head into the front of the face. So I'm basically making a fur base mask, and then I'm making a fur hood, which I sew into the mask. <coughs> this is why I add my ears after. For one of the reasons I add my ears after is because I don't add the hood until after the entire face is done. But everyone will have their own techniques and preferences for that, too. Then once everything's furred, you need to shave it down. Um, Every time I show people shaving, they're like, why did you shave that? It's because it looks a million times better. No animal in their right mind, except for, you know, some fluffy terriers and whatnot, has hair this long on their muzzle. <laughs> and it, the, the more you shave, the less shaggy and weird it'll look. Once you shave everything down, it looks all smooth. You can see all the details you've completely lost. Because if you've got two inches of fur, you, your sculpt or your, your Carving may have been gorgeous, but you lose everything once you have two inches in the way. So you need to shave it down. Um, most people use clippers. They'll buy dog clippers or hair clippers from the store. Bofur is murder on them. You have to clean them and oil them constantly in order to get them to work. And you're going to have to do it like, you'll have to replace your clippers like once a year. 
because the clippers will get so dull because plastic is so horrible. Um, clippers are designed for hair and hair burns. So if you're clipping someone's hair uh, or a dog's hair with clippers, um, the clippers heat up as they go. So it basically burns and cleans out the clippers as it's going. However, because fur is plastic, it won't burn and clean it out. So you literally have to open it up, clean it out, oil it up, and they'll be dull in less than a year for the most part. Um, you can get clippers for like 20 bucks at Walmart. They don't have to be gorgeous, because like I said, you're gonna be replacing it in a year anyway. So you don't have to buy the $70 ones. Um, Carbon Freight's one of the best places <laughs> for what to say. There you go. Dive for like 12 bucks or something. Oh, sweet, yeah. We don't have those in Canada. <laughs> we just have the $20 Walmart specials. Yes. Oh, no. We're almost at the time. We're out of time. <laughs> People are like, I'm wondering if we're going in. Yes. Why don't you just use shorter fur if that's what you want? Because you may not be able to get it in the color you want. Fur and fur dye lots are impossible to find sometimes. So maybe a color you want, or a style you want, or a texture you want, and they just literally doesn't exist. Why you don't want to do that is because you want it to be a length that it needs to be at the end. You just shave it, it and it gets a lot slow, it gets longer till the end. No, sorry. I've had my hand up for a while. Uh, also, with the blanket stitch, if one stitch breaks, you don't have to re sew so the whole thing. True, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, we're actually out of time and I don't want to take up these other people's panel. So, we can like move out into the hallway or down over there, but if anyone had any more questions, because I don't want to take anyone else's panel time. I will be here on Sunday for uh, First Week Building as a Business. So if I couldn't answer your question now, please feel free to find me then. And I'm totally ha after that panel, I'm a ton of time. I'm totally happy to answer your question.